The Artist as Crowd. These notes have been suggested by a perusal, at random, of some recent numbers of the 20th century. They represent what I have brought away from that reading out of the pages, so rich in context, of this review of the most energetic of England's youth. Though what I have thereby been prompted to discuss is a question of universal interest at this moment. In first turning over the pages, I come upon this statement of Mr. Geoffrey West, not a Promethean, of course. Romanticism is a fact. More, it is the modern fact. A contemporary of Byron, or, to take painting, of Delacroix, writing in that vein, would have been making a relatively sensible observation. Or in the heyday of the vogue of Hegel, with romantic in place of honour, in his trinity of ramshackle categorics. But today, has the reaction in painting, for instance, against the sugary romantics of Gauguin, in whose footsteps Lawrence, as a painter, trod, and beyond that, against the photographic naturalism of the Impressionists, been in vain? Has the universal tendency to exchange the Venusberg or the Hernani model for one or more severity, to accept discipline as a fact, to use Mr. West's phraseology, of at least equal importance to emotional unrestraint, escape the notice of this writer? Or does he wish us to believe that back to the sugar sticks is indeed the order of the day, and that the reverse is the monopoly of Mr. Evelyn Waugh or the bright young people? His claims for the emergent evolutionary god of an everyday and in every respect better and brighter universe need not be challenged again, I think though on what grounds he considers this type of evolutionist divinity as de rigueur for every modern young man, he does not make clear in his article. In the same number, Mr. A. S. Neal cries, there is only one way for the educationalists to follow the child, give the child freedom, etc. And a contemporary of Rousseau might quite well be speaking, though I only mention Mr. Neal, also not a Promethean, in order to indicate to what order of contemporary teacher Mr. Geoffrey West would naturally appeal to prove his contention. As to the veritable Promethean personnel, two able young Prometheans, if I am not mistaken, are silhouetted more forcibly than the rest in the pages of the 20th century, namely Messrs. Porteous and Pendle, and these two names seem to represent two extremes within the Promethean body, not political extremes, so much as the extremes of politics and of not politics. What I have to say may be of more interest to the readers of this review, if I, a little arbitrarily perhaps, attach it to these two figures of prominent contributors. Mr. Porteous, particularly gifted as a pictorial artist, is interested in the crafts of painting and of letters to the exclusion of pure politics. With Mr. Pendle, it is the reverse. He appears to be the pure politician, and a very notable one too. The interests of such people as Mr. Pendle compel them to regard with a rather dour eye any intellectual nourishment that is not calculated to build bonny babies, or any discourse that is not visibly directed to improve the house drains, or erect more powerful power stations. Though Mr. Pendle by no means yet quite answers to this description of the politician poor soul. As to Mr. Hugh Gordon Porteous, he appears to be blissfully unconscious of these managerial problems, proper to the very big business and world economics of modern mob politics. I have talked to Mr. Porteous, and I know that he shares with you and me a limitless disgust for all current political leadership, whether Labour or Tory. He realises that if you persevere in the unchecked, unceasing invention, patenting and passage into commercial circulation of more and more machines, designed to replace skilled labour and displaced manpower, then obviously you must have anything up to as much as three quarters of the population permanently unemployed, unless you reduce the hours of labour, without cutting wages, in the same proportion. But that vested interest will obstruct this humane readjustment indefinitely, plunging the world more and more deeply into a purely artificial condition of extreme want. And so, eventually, the watchful and not wholly inactive Marxist must step in with his catastrophic specific and establish state socialism. 
Anyone who imagines that there can be another solution to this political impasse must be a fool. The only point at which we are all apt to part company is the extent to which the vast mechanical plants advertised by the trade journals of the five-year plan are worth writing home about. But that is another question. If I interpret Mr. Porteous rightly, how he differs from Mr. Pendle is as follows. The latter, to the exclusion of any other more abstract interest, is absorbed by this purely practical, economic problem, whereas the intensity with which Mr. Porteous has pursued his literary and pictorial studies causes him to be less interested in the means of revolution than in the only reasonable end of the same. For I am assuming that routine drudgery, however much embellished by fine phrases, or that human life upon the animal plane of a dog or of rat, is meaningless, that it only acquires some significance by reason of its peculiar consciousness of itself, a consciousness typically issuing in works of science, philosophy, and art. I have not the pleasure of knowing Mr. Pendle, but if I did, I believe that he would, at this point, argue somewhat as follows. The creativeness of the artist, he would assert, is not an activity like that of science, independent of the mass enthusiasms or the ideologies of the moment. He would say, perhaps, that his colleague's interest in the royalist and Catholic Mr. Eliot and in the superior and dilettante Mr. Huxley was suspect. He might even go so far as to assert that Mr. Eliot had taken out a profitable patent for what was in fact a peculiar bourgeois despair, as it were. I have heard this said. That melodious groans issued from time to time from the deliberately hollow carcass of Mr. Eliot at the thought of the vanishing of the butler and the upper housemaid. Indeed, he might say more offensive things than that just as he had described Mr. Huxley as occupying a front seat in the cosmic omnibus as it hurtles at top speed towards the abyss, complaining in a loud and peremptory drawl of the imperfect comfort of the upholstery. If I ventured very gently to reason with Mr. Pendle, I should perhaps point out that, as far at all events as Mr. Eliot was concerned, his prestige rested not in the least on his opinions, political or other, but upon his manifest gifts as an artist and that if the hollow men had been written by a communist, to show how hollow all the bourgeois were, rather than by a professed royalist, that Mr. Porteous would no doubt be devoting his time to the study of it with an equal attention. Mr. Edmund Wilson, in America, is contributing a series of long articles to the Herald Tribune, the great capitalist daily of New York, entitled Critics of the Middle Class, Flaubert is one of the persons selected by Mr. Wilson as a conspicuous critic of the bourgeoisie, and, of course, Axel's Castle, his book of literary criticism published a year or so ago, is a good reasoned account of how the intellectual radical politician regards the products of the literary intelligence. But let us suppose for a moment that Moliere had written only one play, namely Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme. Imagine how Mr. Wilson would have pounced upon him and perhaps have clamoured for his statue to be erected facing the Statue of Liberty. Moliere would have been hailed by him as the first Bolshevist Bolivar, and that bourgeois of Moliere's be pointed to as the first great casualty in the war of bourgeois and of proletarian. The artist is one of the rarest of people, in spite of the vast crowds of counterfeits the politician one of the communist. But like the clerk of Monsieur Benda, his standpoint is worth considering. The authentic artist possesses credentials as important as those of the man of science. He is not a 90s esthete, after all, and that he should be free to create outside dogmas, either of politics or of religion, is essential, if he is to function efficiently. Moliere could kill with laughter as effectively as the headsman with his axe, and with infinitely greater discrimination, for his insecticide would reach every true bourgeois and spare every genuine non-bourgeois. But if such an artist were compelled to become partisan and to go on doing bourgeois gentleman because it suited the political taste of the day, or in order to flatter some particular master, it would be just as bad a thing as if he had to do nothing but sing the praises of an emperor or a king. The truth expressed by art, when the art in question is that of Moliere 
or Aristophanes, of Dostoevsky or Swift, is at least as important as is scientific truth, and fundamentally it is, and indeed must be, as disinterested. That, as I see it, is the nature of the difficulty in which the two outstanding Prometheans I have selected are involved. And if I venture to make these remarks, under correction it must of course be understood, it is only because I myself was in part the occasion of a spirited controversy in these pages. Of course, round the question of the individual rages, and always must, a storm of disagreement, if for no other reason, because we, after all, each of us, in our respective ways, are individuals. That Mr. Pendle, for instance, is capable of appreciating an extreme type of individualism, even, is proved by his interesting article on Ramon Gomez de la Serna, the Spanish surrealist. And before I conclude this article, I will advance a tentative suggestion upon that head as well. For really, the artist is somewhat bound up with the individual. Seeing, as I have remarked, how few artists above the Vicky Baum Rex Whistler level there are, and how it seems that really, if you look at it from this standpoint, the artist, whose chief virtue must be his egotism, is bound to appear as one of the capital offenders against the principles of a commune. At first sight.